Okay, and um, we are live now. Hey uh, everyone. everyone. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining. Greetings. I'm Sandrine, co organizer of Legal Hackers Luxembourg. We're a community of lawyers, technologists, entrepreneurs, academics, individuals who want to explore and create solutions at the intersection of law and technology. Um, thanks for your introduction, Sandrine. Uh, my name is uh, Dima. I'm from Kiev Legal Hackers. Uh, I'm helping out uh, Sandrine. Uh, she's doing a wonderful job uh, putting together this event about digital justice um, in different um, parts of the world. Um, um, I work at a uh, uh, the organization called HEAL, the Hague Institute for Innovation in Law. Uh, we do um, accelerator for legal tech startups. And uh, I'm also co-founder at uh, Kiev Legal Hackers. And I'm going to be helping out uh, more technically er, and moderating um, the event a little bit. So we're going to have um, uh, two parts of this event. Uh, let me briefly introduce it. Um, so at part one, we're going to have um, speakers, um, six speakers, um, actually. Um, we're going to have um, Anna Adamska-Galant um, from Kyiv and Poland. Uh, we're going to have Frédéric Boulanger um, from Paris and Luxembourg. Uh, we're going to have um, Anna Sophie Jardin. Um, Probably I mispronounced it. Sorry about that, Anne Sophie. From Paris, we're going to have Maurizio Duarte. Um, he's from, yeah, it's not written down, Colombia, I guess. Um, we're going to have Lucas uh, Goveo Carmo. Um, and we all know, we're also going to have Ana Paula um, from uh, Mexico. And we're also going to have a second part. Um, Sandrine, would you like to briefly introduce the second part? So the second part will consist of um, various questions that we'll be asking um, our speakers. And um, so yeah, we'll see yeah, the second thanks. part then. Yeah, we have a set of interesting questions. Um, that we will bring up to our speakers. But you also can uh, ask questions in a YouTube comment box. We will see uh, them here on the screen in front of us and speakers, speakers also gonna see them in, in front of them. And um, uh, yeah, they can be answered. Please feel free to well. ask your questions. Um, we'll take up a yeah. few minutes to um, make sure that um, one of our speakers can respond to them. Um, yes, and we, uh, as for the timing, we want to have, since we have a lot of uh, very interesting speakers, we want to have about uh, 10 minutes for a presentation for each of the speakers in the first part with the short five minutes Q&A, right, Sandrine? Exactly, so um, five, 10 minutes for Q&A um, after the first part. Uh, then we'll be asking our panelists um, various questions for the second part. And at the end of the second part, there's still time for Q&A. Yeah. Okay, so I think um, now it's enough of introductions. And um, yeah, I would like to invite um, our first speaker or the first part. Um, that's Anna Adamska-Galant, international key expert on judiciary or the EU project Power Justice. Um, she works both in Ukraine and uh, in Poland. So I'm bringing up Anna here. Hello, Anna. How are you doing? Uh, hello, Dima. Hello, Sandrine. It is very nice to be here with mm -hmm. you. Hello, everybody. We have colleagues from various continents, so I'm not sure if it is good morning or good evening. Uh, I'm going from, or I'm speaking from Lublin, Poland, um, but as Dima said, um, I also work in Ukraine. Uh, I used to work almost 17 years as a judge, uh, hearing mainly criminal cases. So 
13 years I was working in Poland and the last five years and a half of my judicial career I was serving as an international judge uh, judge in the Balkan when where I was dealing with uh, war crime cases, organized crime cases, etc. And since uh, January 2018, uh, July 2018, I'm working in Kiev in Ukraine where I am responsible for implementation of a component uh, dedicated to judicial reform in Ukraine uh, that uh, falls within the EU project called um, Pravo Justice. Today I will be shortly speaking about uh, digital solutions uh, implemented uh, within uh, the judiciary both in Poland and Ukraine uh, the topic is very relevant, especially in coronavirus <laughs> time, where we all, when we all are, are forced to, to work to work uh, remotely. From my point of view, I, I, I have returned from Ukraine just uh, at the very beginning of the quarantine, and for the last uh, three months, I'm, I'm working exclusively uh, remotely. I will start sharing the screen to show my presentation. I hope it helps to attract your, your attention. This is always very, uh, very important. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yeah, I will uh, just yeah. and that I will do like this. Okay. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I will talk about uh, digital, dig, digital justice solutions, uh, challenges uh, experienced from Poland and Ukraine, but also what I think important from a point of view of a judge. I'm not an IT specialist, so my perspective may be a little different than than, uh, than a typical uh, uh, approach of people who deal with with IT in IT uh, solutions. Uh, First of all, we all had to adapt to this coronavirus time, uh, which uh, forced us to stop like regular operation. And uh, from a perspective of, of courts, uh, actually in many countries, almost in all, in, in all countries affected by, by coronavirus, there are uh, all hearings were suspended. There were no public sessions organized in courts. Uh, the, uh, all activities of courts uh, were were postponed, unless, unless of course the most uh, urgent cases that have to be dealt with. I want to tell you shortly about uh, the the only solution that worked very effectively during the coronavirus time in Poland. This is uh, the electronic court uh, that deals uh, that uh, that is operating all over Poland. Uh, it is located in court in Lublin, uh, the city where I live. And uh, this court is dedicated dedicated exclusively to decide on small uh, on pecuniary uh, claims. It means that um, the, uh, it means that um, uh, the claimant can file a case with the electronic court uh, fully electronically. It doesn't matter where the plaintiff is located, where is his um, residence. It doesn't also matter where the the uh, the, uh, the claimant uh, lives, because this uh, court in Lublin covers the whole area uh, of Poland. The proceedings is fully electronical, so if you want to file uh, a lawsuit uh, via electronic court. You need to be registered on a specific. You need to be registered on a on a specific uh, platform. You need to create your account there, and in the end of these proceedings, a writ of payment is, is issued. The speed of payment you can see in the right in the right um, uh, right part uh, of the slide. The writ of payment is uh, electronically signed. It has its barcode. It has its uh, specific number that allows uh, to identify. Of course, uh, the writ of payment is issued with participation, not of a judge, but a legal officer. We call it him or her in Polish referendarz. So this is a person that should check the basis, the grounds, whether the, 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 the claim uh, is grounded. But this is such a prima facie, we can say, mm, uh, we can say assessment. Uh, such uh, rate of uh, such rate of payment is uh, served. I'm sorry, something wrong. Such rate of payment is served on the defendant, 
who is allowed to object against such a writ of payment. And what is very important, that this objection against the writ of payment does not require any ground. This is sufficient to write, I disagree. And if the defendant uh, files such, a, such an objection, uh, this uh, writ of payment it, uh, uh, does not become final and cannot be uh, further enforced, and the case is forwarded to a court of general uh, jurisdiction. What is also important, uh, this objection can be filed both electronically or by traditional source. What is also relevant, a person receives the rate of payment, the rate of payment uh, by regular, uh, by uh, regular source. And uh, uh, this uh, electronic court was created in Poland already in 2010. And it had a significant impact on the backlog of cases that were heard by judges. So since then, since formation of the court, judges in Poland, they do not have to deal with all these uh, pecuniary claims, that especially coming from banks, telecommunication companies, uh, which uh, created a significant amount of cases. Now, majority of these cases are uh, being decided uh, with this or by this um, by this electronic court that is located uh, in Lublin. And uh, if the objection is filed, as I said, uh, the case is transferred to a, reg a court uh, of general jurisdiction, uh, depending on a territorial jurisdiction. So not all cases are heard in Lublin, but they are sent to all the courts around uh, around Poland. If there is no objection against the against the the rate of payment, then uh, such an order uh, such an order of payment becomes final, and on the basis of this, uh, a, um, a claimant can uh, commence execution procedure can be can demand a payment uh, from uh, from a debtor mm. from from a defender. So this is the solution, as I said, that operates in two, from 2010. Uh, there has been several uh, there have been several amendments to the law because, as always, when we implement such radical uh, solution, technical solution, not everything could have been predicted at the very beginning. But uh, to sum up, this court uh, has a significant positive impact on operation of the judicial system in Poland. When we talk about, uh, as I said, this uh, this electronic court uh, deals only with civil cases, pecuniary, pecuniary claims. Uh, definitely, a bigger challenge, a bigger challenge, is uh, connected with hearing cases remotely when uh, we talk about criminal cases. And uh, we have discussed with many judges all around Europe, with many lawyers, about challenges that are being faced uh, by by lawyers, by judges, in time of uh, in time of um, of coronavirus, where in many countries um, uh, there there have been attempts to provide um, uh, possibility to hear cases remotely. So uh, various solutions have been have been uh, adopted. For example, in Ukraine, uh, there were specially dedicated legislative amendments to the law, which allow judges to conduct sessions, uh, sessions uh, uh, with using of various telecommunication, uh, telecommunication uh, uh, systems, systems, uh, various uh, applications. Initially, uh, judges were using even these um, uh, these applications that are accessible in the market, like WhatsApp, Zoom, uh, Skype. Then it was decided that they should uh, should use like a stained old or stained uh, state organized uh, organized um, applications. Uh, but uh, what what challenges judges uh, judges face? One of the first challenges that you have to deal with as a judge, this is verification of identity of a person that stands uh, before you or that connects with the court remotely. In uh, normal circumstances where uh, we use video conferences and court proceeding, a person that is located in a remote location is assisted by a court, um, court official or even, uh, even by a judge. And the task of such a judge or court officer is 
first to verify identity of a person standing before uh, before the court, standing before the camera. In case of these solutions that are being implemented now or that are being considered now, the question of identity is more, more difficult to resolve. Of course, uh, we have countries, for example, like in Austria, where all lawyers, they are connected with an with with a electronic system of courts. So they are registered in the system. They have their electronic signature. So it is not such a problem to verify whether a person that connects with the court, with the judge, this is the person uh, that should be present. That this is a party to the proceedings or is a representative um, of, of the party. However, this is in case of, for example, witnesses to, to stand before the court, this is definitely a bigger, uh, a bigger challenge. How to verify uh, the identity of such, uh, such a person. Another very important problem that uh, judges uh, have to resolve or that has uh, hearing of cases or remote uh, or digital justice is publicity of trials. As we know, a right to a public trial is one of uh, the elements of a fair trial. So any person that is uh, standing before uh, the, the court must, uh, must have a guarantee that uh, his or her case is heard publicly. Uh, in this picture, you can see the courtroom, one, uh, one of the courtrooms in Ukraine. As you can see over the bench of judges, there is a screen. And this screen is uh, widely used. And uh, these such screens are actually installed in almost all courtrooms in Ukraine. And they allow uh, for, for this um, connection uh, between courts to have video conferences between courts. And also this system of cameras, screens, etc., allows to streamline uh, the sessions, uh, the sessions, the trial sessions uh, online. So this is one of the one of the options to be used to guarantee the publicity of the trial, to streamline uh, the court hearings on YouTube or other official or official mm -hmm. websites of uh, judicial uh, judicial uh, power. Another very important challenge that is being faced, especially by judges in criminal cases, this is freedom. I've mentioned freedom here, but I wanted to say, I wanted to speak about a freedom of a witness. Because uh, a witness that is to testify in the court, that is to, to, to present its deposition, it is very important that a person speaks freely that there is nobody putting a pressure on uh, on such a person that, that, that testifies before the court. In case of traditional video conference that uh, are often used uh, in various courts where the one court connects with another court, it is not such a big deal because, as I said uh, before, then the witness is assisted by a court officer, judicial officer, or even uh, by a judge. It depends, of course, on legislative solutions uh, in, in, in a specific country. So thanks to it, uh, a judge who is hearing the case, uh, who is hearing the witness uh, via, uh, via um, telecommunication solutions, via IT solutions, can be sure that that uh, uh, that a witness is testifying uh, freely, and uh, from my uh, experience, I, I want to say that um, I, when I was working in the Balkan, I was uh, presiding in the case where we heard almost 100 witnesses uh, using video conference. We were hearing witnesses from Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia. And in each case, uh, the witness was always present um, with, with a judge. There was always a judge present to verify the identity of a witness, to instruct the witness about his or her rights and obligations, and also to guarantee that a witness is speaking uh, freely. Because even uh, please uh, think about it now. When you see me now on your screen, you do not know if I am alone uh, on, uh, in, my, in my office. You also do not know when you have a witness if there is uh, nobody behind uh, the, the screen that would kind of put a pressure of, uh, on, uh, on a witness uh, to testify in a specific way. So these uh, three elements like uh, publicity of the trial, 
freedom uh, for witnesses, defendants uh, to, to make their depositions, and also publicity of the trial. These are very serious challenges that are being faced uh, when it comes to, 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 to um, uh, implementation of solutions of uh, digital justice. So this is very important to think also not only about technical technical requirements, technical limitations, but also about these basic uh, basic challenges and basic rights um, of a fair trial. So uh, this was my short presentation, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, that was incredible how you made it uh, in ten minutes to present. Uh, three key features uh, that you find very important, uh, apart from technical features, but also representing both great uh, great uh, practices from Poland and Ukraine. Um, kudos uh, to you, thank you so much. Um, I was uh, wondering, um, I have a short question, um, because I think we would need to switch to, to another speaker soon. Um, I wonder, um, you said in Poland uh, there is this one court um, who does this um, uh, fully online um, court hearings. Uh, do you think uh, the number of these kind of courts will increase after the coronavirus or is it already increased? Uh, is uh, it enough to have one court like this? You know, this one court is specifically, specifically dedicated uh, to decide on pecuniary cases, on pecuniary mm -hmm. claims. So for payment of, uh, of loans, payment of, uh, you know, uh, for telecommunications, so these kind of cases. So this one court is sufficient. But for sure, uh, we will have to improve in Poland uh, these uh, IT solutions, especially to allow for more video conference and also to have you know, what is very important to provide access to, to electronic files. We still do not have uh, in Poland electronic files. I know that the same as in Ukraine, that the system of electronic files does not exist. And this is like a must now. And I think that thanks to coronavirus, works on it all over the, the world will, will speed up significantly. Yep. Yep, I agree. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna. I hope uh, you can stay with us and uh, give your comments and um, questions to other speakers and for the second part. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. And um, I now would like to invite uh, Frédéric Boulanger. Um, she's a doctoral research at the University of Luxembourg, Faculty of Law, Economics and Finance. Um, she is, um, she stated, um, she works both in Paris and Luxembourg. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why is that? Hello, Frederic. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as uh, Dimitri said, um, I'm actually a doctoral researcher at the University of Luxembourg, mm -hmm. and I'm focusing on the impact of emerging technologies on access to justice. And uh, I did my studies in France, not specifically in Paris, um, but uh, anyway, I did my bachelor in Strasbourg and then I went to Aix-en-Provence and now I'm doing my PhD in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, so I will try to share my uh, presentation. Um, can you see it or not? Um, Black screen so far. Yes. Uh, I, I brought up uh, your screen, uh, but it is uh, black now. Are you are you sharing? Uh, is it a uh, black slides uh, matters? Uh, not at all. I I shared my screen. Um, maybe I will try okay. again. So. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you want to um. try one more time. Yeah, I, I will do so. I will open again my presentation and hopefully it, it will work. Okay. Um, yeah, no worries. Uh, take your time. Otherwise, if not going to work, I'll um, try to do it for you. Okay. Um, so I will try. 
So it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe you can just um, start uh, telling the story uh, uh, and I'll, I'll share the screen. I'll download uh, your presentation from the chat and I'll share it. Shall okay, we go like this? Um, yeah, I will just try a last time because it would be a, a shame not having it. Um, hmm. Yeah, technical gods are not good on you. Oh, I can share my screen. So. Okay, yes, I, I see it here. Okay. Mm. Okay, is it working? Yeah, it's working. <laughs> Go for it, thank you. Okay, great. So, um, I'm very glad and uh, thrilled to be part of this event. And uh, thank you very much for uh, Legal Hackers for having um, invited me. So, let's get started with uh, digital justice toward a resilient and accessible court uh, system. Uh, this subject is more than topical today uh, with what has recently happened with the pandemic. And it raises up actually two questions. The first one is, uh, what would be the key features of an accessible public service of justice, whether in Europe, Asia, Africa or um, America? Will it be by having access to the court decisions? Uh, will it be uh, going before courts by electronic means? Will it be electronic filing? Will it be a video conference? Will it be uh, augmented reality means? Or will it be all this? And the second question would be how the states are going to regulate and frame the use of those technologies in accordance with human rights. So let's have a look at what measures have been recently adopted in France and in Luxembourg to see if any progress have been made towards accessible and digital justice. To that end, I will be addressing two things. The first one will be access to justice from the perspective of open data policies. And I'll be looking at how information technology can support process in promoting access to justice. So let's start with the first part. So in Luxembourg, open data policies for judicial decision have been initiated in 2014 by the former Minister of Justice, Mr. Braz, um, by the paperless justice project called also JUPAL. And it has been recently materialized by uh, making available to the public uh, nearly 40,000 court decisions in 2019 on the website of the Ministry of Justice thanks to the creation of two new databases. You have Judoc and case, a case law database of judicial decisions. And these two, um, th these two databases are complementary in a sense that um, on Judoc, you can find um, a collection of all the summaries of decisions and it gives to the public the main information of any cases they are looking for. So when you are on Judoc, you can enter keywords and once you got all the information that you needed, you can address in the other um, database the more relevant information for instance, um, the number of the decision, and then you will find the entire decision. So those two databases facilitate access to judicial information and to what the judges have ruled. Of course, 
um, there are personal data in those decisions and they are actually subject to pseudonymization to comply with the European data protection regulation. In France, there are actually two laws um, that enshrined the open data uh, policy of judicial decision. The first one is the law for a digital republic published in 2016. And the second one is the law for the reform of, of justice published in 2019. The aim of these two laws is to provide to citizens information about what have been ruled by judges by creating uh, two databases too. You have Jurinet, which holds 460,000 decisions from the Cour de Cassation, and Jurica, which holds 1.5 decisions of civil courts of appeal. And you can find all of those decisions on the website legifrance.gouv.fr. And the objective of those two laws is making available 1.5 million decisions per year to the public. And of course, those two laws enshrine the access to justice decision, but also they protect um, some rights, the right to privacy and the right to pro protect your personal data. Uh, nevertheless, there is a slight difference between those two laws. Um, while the first one, the law for a digital republic, is referring to the right to privacy, the second one is referring to the right to privacy, but also to data protection. And it says um, in the second law that all data uh, that identifies a person must be hidden if they infringes the right to privacy. Now, um, another example of a progress made toward uh, digital justice, it's the use of information technology that support court process. And let's have a look at what is running actually in France and in Luxembourg. So I choose to present today the RPVA, which is um, the Lawyers Private Virtual uh, Network. So it's a tool uh, for lawyers and for judges to put all the um, relevant documents and also all the arguments uh, written by uh, lawyers. So this private virtual network does not permit to lodge a case online, but it permits to fill electronically um, arguments. And how the uh, lawyers can have access to this private virtual network by the means of a cryptographic key, which identify them. And they got it when they enroll to the bar. In contrast, in Luxembourg, there is actually no such a private virtual network and everything is done by hard copy. Um, you have an exception. Um, one step had already been reached uh, during the lockdown. Um, the instruction uh, chamber sorry, uh, allowed to initiate a case by email uh, while depositing all the necessary documents uh, at the court office. Then I also choose to present another information technology tool um, that runs in France and in Luxembourg. It's video conferencing system. So in France, before 2011, um, was <clears throat> it was allowed only for witnesses and experts hearing. From 2011, it was allowed for provisional 
detention. Um, the person could nevertheless uh, be opposed to such a video conferencing um, unless there were risk for public order or risk of escape. And since 2019, the use of video conferencing is widespread in France under, of course, certain conditions, and it's in criminal law. Um, and in contrast, in Luxembourg, uh, video conferencing is uh, already set up in all the jurisdictions. So you would maybe say that it's widespread, uh, it's used, and so on and so forth. But um, not really, because um, it's due to the size of uh, the country. Um, it's not really a time-saving tool. So all the jurisdictions are equipped for video conferencing, but um, they are actually uh, not uh, really used. So, um, to conclude, I would say that some progress have been made toward digital justice, um, both initiated by the laws, but also um, by the use of some information technology within the judiciary. And we will see in the second part um, what are the next steps toward digital justice. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Frederic. That was uh, very interesting to me. I, I have one question in my mind, but before I just wanted to ask maybe Sandrine uh, had a comment or a question. So, or, what have you? Sorry, thank you, yeah, uh, Frederic. Um, very impressive presentation. Very interesting to see the country, France, and Luxembourg. Um, so. What is your take um, on other more private um, accessibility, private firms um, providing access to justice? Um, so all the case law on, of French uh, law, for instance, um, there are a few legal texts uh, who are in this sphere. Yeah, so what do I think about the use of court decisions by um, legal tech? Is it uh, your question? Sure, your, your take on it, yes. Yeah, um, I think it could be... Um, so I won't uh, choose an answer because it's very complicated to uh, answer quickly. Um, I think it could be a very um, useful tool to uh, process all the court decisions um, because then the judges will see what their peers uh, already ruled. Um, but also um, there is a kind of uh, black box phenomenon uh, around uh, private firms uh, because um, I will I will tell you this uh, later in the second part but uh, you don't really know how um, they are funded and if there is behind uh, the technology some economic incentives and some economic benefits and you usually don't really know how your personal data are processed. And as you know, in the EU, uh, you have this um, European uh, data protection regulation, uh, which applies. So we, it could be a useful um, tool. And those um, law firms are, are making uh, many progress towards digital justice. But maybe the public sector should also work with uh, those um, legal tech and side by side. So yes, that's that's my answer. So creating an ecosystem. Yeah. Sorry, creating an ecosystem of private and public. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, a kind of, but maybe I'm an idealist and maybe some other people would uh, say something else. Um, Definitely. Yeah. 
Thank so, you. Uh, Dimitri, any questions? Yeah. Um, that's an interesting topic that you touched, Sandrine, and you answer, Frederick. And um, continuing on that one, um, with regards to two platforms that you named uh, that published uh, so many uh, core decisions, uh, that's very impressive. Um, and I was wondering um, in what format are they, are they published? Are they machine readable? Are they um, published through API or is it like only a PDF documents? Uh, so in Luxembourg, it's on a PDF, actually. Uh, and in France, uh, I'm not so sure. I think it's both, but um, maybe uh, the next speaker would uh, let us know about it. I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a, a good comment. Uh, but maybe it's time for me to introduce the next speaker. Um, thank you very much, yeah. Frederic. Looking forward much. to having thank you. Thank you very time. much. See you. Um, thanks. Okay, so we go to um, Anne Sophie um, Gidoin. She's a French lawyer and project leader of Alternative Justice, a bridge to alternative dispute resolution. Um, she also works um, in Paris. So, um, okay, give me a second. So I'll um, bring up Anne Sophie. Okay. Yes. Hello, Anna Sophie. Hello. Um, maybe you want to comment on the previous uh, question if you have anything to add about the uh, API. I wish, how... but I'm not so sure about the answer since uh, today I will be focusing more on arbitration. Mm -hmm. I am. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am an arbitration lawyer. I practice in Paris, and I will um, share my screen. Yes, and uh, speak about um, um, sorry, I need to maybe open the PowerPoint instead. Um, just one second. Yeah, so I will speak about uh, arbitration as an example of digital justice. Um, actually, it should be working. Yeah, take your time. I think it works best if you first open the, the document and then, oh yeah, it comes up. Okay. Yeah, so you have, you have the projection? Sure. Yeah, it's yeah. right. Okay, uh, so the, the question that um, yeah, I will discuss today is whether arbitration could be an example of digital justice. Uh, first, I have been trying to define digital justice. Um, so using both the definition of justice and digital. So I, I have defined it as the administration of law relating to di digital signals and computer technology. Um, and the principles of justice, which I have identified today, are accessibility. So, um, um, Frederic was just discussing access to justice, resilience, which is also in the title of this presentation, and effectivity. Um, and now, uh, the question is why choosing arbitration as an example for digital justice? Well, first of all, um, most, I mean, maybe you know what arbitration is, but I will just define it one, uh, one more time here. Uh, it's when parties agree to an alternative to domestic court justice uh, for an arbitral tribunal appointed by parties to decide their dispute and render a final and binding decision. So first, arbitration is an alternative justice to, to public justice, I would say. And for that reason, it is also an innovative justice because since it's private, it has to adapt a lot to, um, to, to business consideration and it has to um, respond to, to, to uh, business competition. And for that reason, it's very experimental. And I think that during COVID, we've seen that arbitration adapts very quickly. Uh, so today I will uh, focus on the question whether 
uh, arbit digital arbitration serve the principle of um, of justice, those principles that we've identified, access, uh, resilience, and um, and and uh, effectiveness. So just one second, uh, sorry. Um, so now, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, so now I will just discuss a few examples of uh, digital arbitration, whether it reinforces accessi uh, accessible and resilient uh, justice. Um, and I've identified two fields. Uh, first, um, substance and process. Those are the same, actually, as discussed before by Frédéric. Uh, so substance is a bit wider than that, that for me, just data data analytics. Um, I've distinguished between facts and law because in arbitration we manage both the, the factual history and the, and the law. And uh, we have uh, seen a lot of um, tools in arbitration to uh, digital tools to manage uh, facts and, and law and also to analyze, analyze, analyze them very much. In fact, um, I've, I've just given a few examples. It's not to do publicity, but those are just examples that come into my mind and that we use a lot in arbitration. So for um, facts, I have the example of a Relativity, which is a software that manages like documents and goes through uh, analytics of them and stores them, files them, and then you can search uh, in, in the documents and make relations between keywords, etc. So it's very helpful. And for legal research, I've taken an example of a very targeted uh, legal research um, software that is called Use Mundi and that is specific to international law. So it's very advanced uh, in one specific field. Uh, now for a uh, process, um, well, we have various tools and the first one that comes to my mind is, is concerns tribunal constitution because in arbitration we select our arbitrators. And in order to help with that, uh, various tools have arisen. Uh, for example, Arbitrator Intelligence is a tool where you would type the name of someone and you would find the record and whether they've been sitting with other tribunal members, so whether they would have conflict of interest. Um, it's very useful. Um, and then, well, as, as discussed already before, I think uh, in Ukraine and uh, in France and the Luxembourg, we're going towards paperless uh, cases, filings. Um, and for that, I, I'm referring to a very useful tool that's called Exhibit Manager, and that's on the law on the console side for preparing your brief. And it creates e-briefs, so all the references are hyperlinked and there is no need to file documents uh, or when there is an amendment to reference, it just automatically updates everything. Um, and the last, um, top, the last topic for process is uh, our vi virtual hearings. In fact, those have been so extensively discussed during the COVID crisis that the reference that I put there is uh, the link to the virtual arbitration forum where software and guidelines and solutions are discussed between arbitration lawyers. So it's a, it's a very, um, I mean, we've been having virtual hearings. There are lots of discussions about how to, for example, cross-examine a witness in a virtual hearing um, and so about also time zones because we are in an international practice. So uh, it's, it's challenging to have an arbitration between a party in California and another one in Singapore. Um, so there are many issues, and this is um, this, those examples I think show that um, di um, digital arbitration makes justice more accessible, and and they show a very res resilient justice. But by definition, arbitration has to be resilient because it's it's in a competitive market. Um, now I'm I think that more uh, more exists to invent. Um, as regard access still and effectiveness uh, with digital arbitration. D so I will start with effectiveness because for me, effectiveness is about enforcement. It's when justice is rendered and I don't see any way to enforce an arbitral award that would 
like prevent from going to court with the award and having a stamp on it. So at this stage, um, enforcement still requires physical presence uh, at the seat of the arbitration. And uh, I, I think maybe we could imagine uh, digitalization at this stage, but it hasn't been done. Um, what is discussed a lot, and it was it's very interesting that it was discussed uh, before by Frédéric, is access. So we've seen all the access because of access to information, making the process more accessible. But I think more could be done on the funding side, on the funding side, because as you know, arbitration is not free com uh, in comparison with uh, court justice, and some parties cannot fund an arbitration, but there exists already solution out there, like private funders, uh, fi uh, financial companies. And I think putting them in, con like connecting arbitration um, users and funders could uh, maybe could be helped with um, digital solutions. Um, and so uh, as regard as regards access, I will speak, I will uh, say two words about the project that we've been working on with Sandrine uh, from Legal Hackers um, during the Legal Hackathon organized by Financial Times. Our um, project was also meant to enhance access to justice. Uh, our project is a bridge uh, between to from state courts to arbitration or mediation. And the way to build that bridge is uh, that we offered a very easy and and user-friendly solution to generate an arbitration clause. And this arbitration clause would just require entering fields in uh, online on, on the website. You have a link in the, in the presentation. Once you enter your field, uh, tailoring your needs, you, you generate a clause and then you can uh, move your, your dispute to arbitration. So that was also meant to enhance access. Uh, now my opening question uh, is actually um, is is a little thinking about digital arbitration in the system and it was is the systemic impact of digital arbitration for the lawyers I think as a lawyer I'm a lawyer um, it's it requires us to rethink the lawyers added value in in a system or working on a case uh, so for me, I, I think from the arbitration perspective, but I can imagine that in other specialties of law, it also applies. And I think that digitalization of arbitration shows that we should really focus as persons on our soft skills. Here, I've, I've added a little chart that shows the pyramid structure of, you know, a, a law, big law firm before digitalization and, and the, the structure today, which is more of a rocket structure. The green part is the lawyer's part. And where we use lawyers before to do all these tasks, we're now using project managers, tech managers, tech teams, you know, paralegals, and lawyers are here in the middle. Um, so their space is shrinking, but it's also, um, I think that the, the main skills will now be client relationship, drafting, style and all the beyond legal coordination, which is coordinating project management, tech management. And so for, for so yes, for this reasons, thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank, thank you, you very you. much for, uh, for inviting me. Sorry for the screen sharing. I should have used the PowerPoint instead of the PDF, but that's why lawyers need to <laughs> learn more. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, it's been very um, nice in the shift um, in how uh, legal services will be uh, implemented uh, and the shift that's um, also within a law firm. Um, I thought it was quite interesting to see that perspective, how uh, the digital impacts um, big structures um, and how... Yes to facilitate um, and work with the outside as well. Um, so how do you elaborate with clients um, and create a bridge as well? So, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, that was very interesting. And I like the last part. Uh, so we, uh, you're saying that um, probably lawyers are getting more T-shaped. Did I get it right? Um, having more extra skills instead of being just lawyer. 
Yes, I think it requires being more open to that and being able to understand uh, because what's needed from us will not be document review or analytics. It will be very different and we need to find our like clients need in, in that uh, world where technology will replace a lot of, of tasks um, and also be able to manage the technology for clients because I don't think they, they will be expecting to pay fees for something that can be done by a computer. Yeah, of course. For instance, the exhibit manager example is very interesting because this is a task that we've been doing for years especially in arbitration and, and paper filings and the fact that it can be replaced so easily and is being replaced already for five years, you know, uh, in some firms is, is interesting. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to bring up a comment. Uh, actually, we have two comments um, from Marta. Uh, she was um, typing this comment um, uh, a little I bit think before. Frédéric. Yes, yes, um, Frédéric. I um, didn't showcase them on time, but I think it's uh, nice to showcase um, what yeah. our uh, comments from our um, uh, from people who joined to see. Um, so uh, Marty is saying, what are the reasons for video conference not being used in Luxembourg? Um, that's a question probably um, not uh, relatable uh, to you, Anne-Sophie, right? And, and there is another question that is size of country should not be an excuse for an uh, for not using video conferencing in criminal cases where victim witness is not is deeply traumatized. Um, yeah, thank you for your comments, Marta. And yeah, thank you, Anna Sophie. Uh, very interesting arbitration about uh, bridging the gap uh, of justice with uh, with arbitration. A very interesting angle. I, I never thought of. Um, Thank you so much for bring, bringing it up to us um, and educating us. Okay, so now we move to uh, our next speaker. Um, that's uh, Maurizio, uh, Maurizio Duarte. Um, give me uh, a second. So I'll bring Maurizio to the screen. Okay. Hello, hello Maurizio. Hey, hello, guys. So, Maurizio is international associate and justice entrepreneur at uh, A2G Tech Store um, from Guatemala City. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm gonna like share my. Something. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen and let's see if it it's working. I don't know if you can see my screen right now. Uh, okay. Yes. Give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. Uh, so a bit of context of myself, because I think uh, I, I sometimes I question myself how I ended up working on legal tech and uh, A2J tech. It's uh, a legal or a social enterprise that builds different types of technology to tackle access to justice issues. It's uh, uh, located, located in Denver, Colorado. So, for example, I'm an attorney. It was licensed in Guatemala, but now working with a legal tech company in Denver. So sometimes the your path as an attorney changes. So that's an important thing to always have in mind. So when I was approached to talk about this topic, which I find really interesting, is I I went back and, and analyzed what does access to justice really means. Uh, even last week, I, I had a call with a colleague of mine in the region and he talked access to justice is a broad term that is it, it doesn't only mean going to the courts and having access to legal services or to affordable legal services having accessible legal information and so on so it's the scope it's broad regarding access to justice so when we think about access to justice is not only courts but it's overall how to make the legal system better for users so with a2j tech uh, one of the questions that started with the COVID-19 pandemic is, okay, one of the biggest issues is how to resolve disputes. And there are two ways of resolving disputes now with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. One is the implementation of, of virtual courts. And the other one is using ODR systems that we probably have heard about ODR as alternate dispute mechanisms that are online. 
uh, and virtual ports. So those are the two alternatives that we have in COVID-19. And for example, you can see on, on the right of my screen, you can see the, the headlines that started to appear, uh, COVID-19 uh, virtual ports, what is gonna happen. So one of the things with A2J Tech that we like to, to do is we like to frame every project regarding the implementation of virtual ports or any type of legal tech project that we execute is we always look at it from the perspective of legal project management. I know legal project management sometimes has been a, a buzzword or something that people uh, don't feel comfortable talking about, but uh, like I like to frame it as project management, it's something that has been existed for decades. And it's actually one of the most interesting uh, skills that an attorney can acquire. It's, it's, uh, it's been document, documented or there's data that shows that using a project management, regardless of the industry and regardless of the project, increases your chance of achieving and completing a, a project by 40%. Once you have a project management a manager, you can be certain that there is 40% chance additional, 40% that you're gonna finish that project. So anytime we have a, a project via ODR systems or virtual court systems, we always try to frame it from a legal project management perspective. And once we look around, for example, in the remote, remote courts worldwide initiative by Richard Susskind, uh, we were looking at the, let's say, context, not only in Latin America, but in, in the world. And we, we could see that in, in Europe, uh, there were a lot of efforts uh, for the implementation of virtual courts. I mean, there were many systems that have been uh, working. For example, many of my colleagues recently showed how it works in France, how it works in Luxembourg, and how it works in Ukraine, which I found really, really interesting. I'm not an attorney in Europe, so I cannot relate to those systems, but I understand many of the technical issues that go behind it. So just a quick perspective, because I know uh, our time is limited and I don't want to take uh, many of, of, of the time on the upcoming speakers is what has been happening in Guatemala, just to give you a, a, a global glimpse. I still have a a law firm in Guatemala, which I mostly advise here tech startups or legal tech startups and tech companies in general. I am not in litigation, although I was in a previous life or in a previous practice, I was in arbitration, international arbitration. I do not practice it anymore. And how has been in Guatemala, and this is, for example, one of the actual shots of one of the courts that has been existing so far. That although we are starting to implement virtual courts, is not a it's not a complete virtual system. We're still relying on the physical infrastructure of the judiciary. So, for example, you can see here we have uh, a panel of three judges, that, and they are having a remote hearing. Although the parties are not in the court, the um, the judges or magistrates in this in this occasion are in the physical infrastructure. Of the judiciary. So Guatemala has been starting to implement some virtual courts, not, I would not say at a hundred percent rate, it has been slowly starting to see the, the value behind having uh, virtual courts. And one of the things that happened, I think, not only in Guatemala, but around the region in Latin America, is that when COVID-19 started, most of the judiciary and even arbitration proceedings uh, were suspended, indefinite. It was look, we don't have any alternatives to keep the process going, so we're gonna suspend all the process. And that happened both in arbitration and in, in uh, the judiciary. So what happened is after three months, and for example, in Guatemala, I know that the restrictions for COVID-19 are still ongoing. Uh, they're probably looking at four months of restrictions because the curve hasn't flattened down as most of the Latin American region. So you have to come up with an alternative. And the thing is with the alternatives in Guatemala right now, and I think that this goes as a criticism on my part, we're looking at virtual courts and ODR systems as a short-term solution when it should be looked at as a long-term solution. We're not just tackling an alternative for COVID-19, but we should be tackling an alternative for access to justice in general. So I think uh, Guatemala is still doing its efforts mostly in uh, for solving uh, civil and commercial matters, but also labor law. 
Uh, in family law are the four main areas of practice that the virtual courts are trying to tackle. Uh, and uh, the constitutional court, because we have a constitutional court that is similar to the Supreme Court in the U.S. Uh, that oversees constitutional matters that have certain importance. They have been also having some uh, virtual hearings, but although it's not been in 100 percent, I will probably say that 30, 40 percent of the cases have been on virtual courts that are still relying on some physical infrastructure. So it's not a, an entire virtual process that we have. So with that in mind, and I just want to show you one of the things that we've been looking at with A to J is that we have been starting different partnerships. And one of the partnerships that we have started looking at this, uh, that this problem of virtual courts is we started a partnership with RDO, which is Resolve Disputes Online, which is basically a platform for you uh, take control and administer any type of proceedings, even if it's arbitration, mediation, or, or even virtual, uh, Courts from the judiciary, you can use RDO as a system that has a protocols put in place uh, to have control of any type of proceeding. So I think one of the important path, uh, aspects of, of access to justice or virtual courts or related or not, they're not the same, is looking at the value of legal tech as a tool that can enhance and improve access to justice. And that effort is not only by, by independent efforts, but you have to collaborate and partner up with other enterprises and other projects that have some insight. For example, REO was uh, a platform made of, of experts in arbitration and alternate dispute resolutions, but the platform can be used for other virtual courts. So uh, I just wanted to give that general overview. I, I don't wanna spend much of the time. So that's from my part and thank you again. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mauricio. I relate a lot uh, to what you were saying, and uh, I constantly also switch between legal tech and access to justice, and that's uh, very interesting. Uh, where do you see the overlap? I think that the overlap is, although legal tech and access to justice have been uh, probably starting to seem as the same thing, I think what happens with legal tech is that it accelerates the impact of a solution that is trying to decrease the access to justice problem. So technology is not going to solve the, the, the core problem, but it's gonna accelerate the solution that might uh, diminish the problem surrounding access to justice. Sometimes we think technology can solve everything, but I, I, in my perspective, technology is a tool as it can be good for, it can have good intentions or bad intentions, it depends the technology is just gonna uh, magnify the efforts that you're doing. So for example, if you are in a, let's say in a cybersecurity attack, you can use technology and it's gonna magnify the negative efforts you're trying to do. But if you're using technology for something good, it's gonna magnify and accelerate the efforts that you're trying to do. So I think the overlap is access to justice and legal tech are not the same, but technology will certainly accelerate and improve the solutions. The one of, that's why legal project management looks what is the solution? Technology is something that is going to be helpful, but what is the core solution that we're looking at? Are we creating the same solutions that we had in place in the physical infrastructure, or are we creating new solutions that are adaptable to the new needs and new type of problems that are arising in a digital economy? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I also support your point of view, and actually we support a lot of legal tech uh, startups in our accelerator in order to create impact and uh, for people to get access to justice. So we say, if you resolve or prevent some of the problems of the people, then you actually add up to access to justice, even though you're, uh, you're a purely legal tech. Uh, so it's an interesting one. Um, so, Sandrine, do you, do you have any uh, comments or? What has been the response uh, so far with the lawyers uh, and the community? Uh, I, I'll probably frame it from two different perspectives or from the two different cultures that I'm working at. Uh, first, uh, regarding the scope in the U.S., I think we have a positive uh, uh, we have a positive impact in which lawyers are becoming more uh, concerned and actually looking at how to implement legal tech in access to justice. And 
what I like about, for example, some of the insights that I've been getting from the U.S. is that they frame access to justice in a broad term. So even if it means how to change your name, for example, we have an initiative of how to change your name, that is still access to justice. So that's one perspective that I like. And the other perspective is more on Latin American side that is more of a civil system. Uh, we'll still have some difficulties, I guess, because there are some so restrictions into how we can exercise as an attorneys and sometimes even notaries. So there has been some pushback from some attorneys that have, have been, let's say, brought up in a different uh, mindset of attorneys. So it goes what to the previous, uh, uh, the previous conference that we were talking about, the soft skills. Some lawyers have been pushing back and have been avoiding this type of changes. However, we think it's just a matter of time. Some countries in Latin America are more advanced in, than others. For example, I could uh, mention Colombia, I can mention Peru, Brazil uh, are some countries that are m more advanced in the legal tech uh, atmosphere, I, I, Mexico as well. But I think it's just going to be creating a domino effect throughout the region in which we're going to start looking at more tools that are going to tackle access to justice problems as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Maurizio. Great to hear your perspective. It's really now going um, different continents. Very interesting. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for now. I'll switch to um, Lucas. Um, Lucas Karma. He's a CEO at um, your base. Okay, we have Lucas here. Um, hello, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm Lucas. I am founder of Your Base and also Direito Noir, which is a legal tech that helps people that had problems with flight cancellations, flight delay, to find their rights and justice. So it's very curious because we are trying to innovate in this field for a while but we find a lot of barriers, especially from the lawyers and especially from the, the organ that regulates the, the lawyers in Brazil. And it's called OAB, it's like the Brazilian Order of Lawyers. So I have a lot of interesting things to say. So let's begin with my presentation. I will share my screen. Yes, please do. It's interesting uh, maybe for you to know that in our Innovating Justice Challenge last year, we have the winner who also does exactly the same. He helps Re people really? to yeah to solve uh, flight cancellation and similar issues. What's the name of the legal tech? Um, their name is airlaw.pro. Oh, that's cool. We are expanding for other fields since, such as labor problems, and also problems with secure, secu uh, all kind of consumer problems I can show you later. But all right, I'm from Legal Hackers Rio, and we are talking about digital justice towards a resident and accessible court system. And I know that lawyers make a lot of objections. So if you have some objections, please, Feel free to, to ask me later. So how are we dealing with virtual courts? In Brazil, since 2015, all processes must be filed online. And still we have a lot of cases, I think more than 50% of the cases, they are physical. And all the physical cases, they last way more longer than the, the virtual ones for obvious reasons. And however, we have a chaotic scenario because there are at least four different systems for filing the cases online. In Rio, we have one. In Sao Paulo, we have other one. And other states, we have different ones. For me, with this legal tech, it's really chaotic because we have uh, flyers from all over Brazil and we need to deal with all the different systems. There are some, some legal techs that are emerging and they deal with, they try to solve this problem by, by making one unique system 
and they did not figure out yet, but I think that in some months they are going to. So how are we do dealing with coronavirus? Everyone got surprised by this virus and in Brazil it was not different. So all the processes, they were suspended until the end of June. June. Now they are getting back on track, but all, all states, they can regulate specifically for their re re region. And it's difficult because in Rio, for example, even though we are a huge city, we are not making online hearings. And in Manaus, that's a small, smaller city, for example, they are doing it through WhatsApp. And that's crazy because you should think that Rio by being a big city would be modern city, but that's not true. We are already had online, online, online hearings, but but there were special laws for coronavirus that allowed video conferences for online processes. The online hearings, they are made through WhatsApp, Cisco WebEx and Zoom. For me, none of these solutions is the, the right one especially because it's, they are not open source. And I'm going to go back to this later. But for sure, coronavirus has helped Brazil to towards the digital transition. And that's because we needed to do a lot of things. So a lot of laws was, were made to try to help this situation. Lawyers are talking about this. There are some judges that are working faster and their employees too. So there are some, in some places, they have not delays anymore after they started to work remotely. And what are the challenges in Brazil? I think that just like all the other countries in development, the classes D and E, that is the poor people, they do not have access to high quality internet. And in some cases, in Brazil, in Brazilian legislation, we need the part to be in the hearing. And 40% of the, the these classes, they cannot do that. So this would be an obstacle to justice. And we would think, okay, since it's online, it's easier, it's faster, it's cheaper, but this we have to think it deeper. How would we make this possible for people that really need the justice and cannot go online? Uh, publicity is also another challenge because we don't know how to, to keep these hearings online and safe. Other problem is that all the states, they have autonomy to implement the hearings the, if they want to and how they want to. Cisco WebEx, they made a really problematic deal with Brazilian government. No one knows what they agreed, what they would do with the data. And the government said, okay, if you want to, you can use Cisco but a lot of courts are not using it because of privacy concerns. And the biggest problem for me, biggest problem is that there is none, none open source solution that can help us to, to keep privacy. Why open source solutions would be the best bet? Because if we can have access to the code, we would know exactly how they would deal with our data. And WhatsApp is from Facebook. Zoom is a huge company that had problems with privacy in the past, in the recent past. So we should look for open source solution. Uh, I don't know if there is any in the market yet, but if there's not, there is a really good opportunity for the, the community to develop it. 
And in Brazil, we have some problems, some barriers with the law, especially in the criminal field. And if you want to change the law for making online hearings and make online courts, we need a lot of discussions and it takes a lot of time. So since 2015, we are going deeper in this transition. Coronavirus came to make it faster, but we still have a lot of challenges. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, that's very interesting um, that you mentioned uh, open source uh, solutions. And uh, I actually know uh, one video conferencing uh, solution that is open source and works quite well. That's called Jitsi. It's uh, G I T S I dot org. Um, so anybody who's interested in open source, um, I think um, that's the way to go. And it's quite decent, I would say. It has a lot of functionalities, like even more than Google Meet. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Oh, and that's that's good to know. Thank you. Yep. Sandrine, and, um, do you have any Lucas, questions I was wondering... uh, or comments? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was wondering, um, with respect to this, one aspect is accessing the actual documents, um, case law, for instance, or laws. Um, another aspect is also understanding what is inside the document. Would you say that um, the documents are quite understandable for a lay person? Mm, no, no. No, okay. It's... So legal design maybe might help with that issue yeah. as well then. We have a startup, Legal Tech, in Sao Paulo that's called Verifact, and they have a solution that can make, can show the judge and the other lawyer that that print screen, for example, is reliable. But we have, we do not have, for example, laws that say how the document should come and what it should show. But if the lawyer does not present a reliable proof, a reliable document, the, they will just lose the, the case. Okay. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Um, OK, Lucas, thank you for now. Uh, we're going to move um, to uh, Ana Paula. Ana Paula uh, Rumualdo, she's a cyber lawyer. Uh, legal AI privacy and data protection expert from Mexico City. Hello, Anna. Hi, Dima. Hi, Sandalin. How are you? Thank you for having me in this Good. interesting event. Thank you. Good. Be happy to hear uh, some of your thoughts about digital justice. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen. Yeah, it's coming. Okay, great. So, first things first, what we talk about when we talk about digital justice? Because it seems like we're talking about the same thing, just virtual courts or online process, but sometimes it um, there's another element in digital justice. So it might be algorithmic justice. This is not the case, but I wanted to mention because when we are talking about this subject, sometimes this came up. Uh, how um, can, can a software help judges to uh, make decisions quicker, easier, more accessible? Well, uh, that's, that discussion is uh, very complex. And um, probably algorithmic justice is not for uh, suitable for complex decision um, because we can encode biases on uh, of human judges into more um, complex scenarios uh, into the software. Um, however, uh, this presentation is about online processes. Um, 
Actually, I just wanted to mention that um, the algorithmic justice, uh, it's also about justice, but our, our, our idea of justice is uh, deeply embedded in ancient values. And uh, it's difficult to translate such values um, to code in software. So probably uh, process simpler process like the ones that uh, Lucas was um, addressing um, are easier to tackle with algorithmic justice. And by the way, just if you type justice on Prezi, uh, <laughs> Mr. Spock came up. You know, volcanoes are the example of justice for uh, Prezi, but uh, let's keep with online process. So, uh, what was the reason for online process to come uh, besides um, technological advances? What is wrong with our legal old process? Aren't we okay with that or what happened? Well, Probably if we uh, read or listen to Richard Suskin, who's been uh, writing about this subject since the 80s, um, the legal system is um, lawyer centric, which means is for us, for us to understand it, for us to file the claims, for us to be the intermediary between the client and the judges or the uh, justice system. I mean, justice systems, um, uh, administrative uh, justice or a judicial uh, process. So uh, sometimes we make things harder, to be honest, for clients. And that was not right. The um, clients sometimes complain that um, our fees are really high, that they don't understand us. We then made things easier for them, even though we um, came to their lives in one of their most difficult times for them. If you think about this, uh, when does a client need a lawyer? Just when, um, generally, when they're in trouble uh, and they remember having um, contact with a lawyer, having engaged, uh, engagement with a lawyer, during a very difficult time in their lives. And uh, that's it, we're not doing it easy. And the system is designed for us and not for doing uh, the things easier for clients. But uh, digital technologies are um, accelerating the, um, um, a, a wider adoption um, or a wider access of, um, to justice. And that's a thing that can change with these digital technologies. So I'm giving you my perspective from Mexico. And the um, thing here is that we have online process since 2008. Um, but these processes were administrative process and they are in the federal law of administrative contentious procedures. Um, this means that is um, when the clients have certain um, or issue with um, administrative authority, not between um, natural persons. So um, despite the online process is um, not really up and running, but was in the law since 2008, the first decision came in 2011. Um, it last that that um, that case lasts, um, if I'm not wrong, like a month. So this was really quick for this kind of procedures that can last um, from six months to four years. So this was a simpler um, a simpler case than the ones that last for four years, but still, it's a, uh, it was a really good advance. However, I remember that not many lawyers and not many people were confident or supportive um, to the online process. They, uh, they, were, um, they didn't feel comfortable using the process, because using the online process, because what will happen if the 
if, if the system fails. You know, it, it, in Mexico, some systems have failed, even with federal elections. So that's probably why some people think uh, if that system failed, this system can fail. I mean, it's not that easy. Uh, oh, um, I absolutely agree. But that's uh, one of the things that explain the, the fears and distrust from people and lawyers to online process back in those days. And also, when you file a claim electronically, you need to use your electronic signature that in this case uh, needs to be an advanced electronic signature that is equivalent to um, certificate signatures in Europe. And um, the use of electronic signatures is uh, also not uh, quite accepted, not really, uh, people weren't really supportive about the use of the electronic signature. Also, um, there was there was and there is a cultural resistance that we're fighting um, back right now. Uh, but um, in 2008 and 2011, that was really um, surprising, using an, uh, an electronic advanced signature for an online claim. So despite um, those, um, um, those things that I'm just uh, saying, that wasn't enough, you know. Uh, that wasn't enough for for Mexico. They they, they 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 thought, yeah, of course we have this um, the possibility of uh, filing an online claim, but also in the law there were uh, options um, to reject the um, presentation of the online claim. So. Um, for example, if, I, uh, if I'm the claimant and, and I, I, I file the claim, the defendant can reject the online process and then the process would need to be conducted physically. Um, and um, depending on, the, there, there was also an option um, if the notification wasn't received or something like that, also the entire process uh, was to be conducted uh, physically. So um, it was, um, despite it was an option, there were, there were m even more options to conduct this process uh, physically because they, um, I mean, the administrative court and the law um, didn't want to um, like make people uncomfortable, much more uncomfortable with the use of uh, digital technologies or um, feeling like they were obliged to use their electronic signature. And that is um, despite the fact that we in Mexico, uh, all taxpayers have a certificate signature, but um, its use is not very socialized. So that's, the, that, that's why I'm saying that um, despite we have all the tools, to do an, an online process, not a virtual court entirely, an online process, uh, we didn't because that wasn't enough and uh, there was so much cultural resistance. Then the coronavirus came and it changed everything. So if there was the cultural resistance that I was talking to you about um, um, regarding the use of electronic signatures, regarding the use of online process, then there was no other option. So uh, people start to get interested actually in online process, in electronic signature, because you know, it's um, one and, and uh, they are like uh, together. You cannot file an, uh, an electronic complaint if you don't use your electronic signature, but um, those were steps that we need to walk slowly uh, for uh, for the change not to be so drastic. However, we uh, because of this resistance, we enter like like um, um, like in I, I like to call this uh, um, like in asteroids uh, on online process. So there was no turning back, and if you weren't using those technologies, uh, you weren't filing anything yeah, and you couldn't access anything um, 
uh, regarding um, online process. Even though if you don't file an online um, complaint, you still in in some states uh, um, in uh, and in on in also in federal courts, you can check the documents of your process online. But many people didn't didn't do that, and you can also be notified um, via email. And uh, people usually reject that possibility because they think that the um, there, there will be problems about those notifications and that probably the authority can um, uh, say that, oh, yeah, I notified, uh, I notified those people a uh, certain date and they actually didn't. And um, I think that was a big misunderstanding of how the online process work. But um, like I said before, the COVID-19 um, change, change it all. So now we're migrating much more um, to online process. And uh, the thing is that not only it's in the law now that people are actually using it. People are actually actually filing um, complaints and filing um, different documents online. So um, the Federal Electoral Court this is a, um, a really funny uh, fact that the Federal Electoral Court um, held its sessions on email. Yeah, over email, believe it or not. They found that uh, communications via email were the best um, way of communicating. Oh yeah, it's like, I, I know it's video conferencing. We know that it's video conferencing, but th this, um, this tell us um, that the that court wasn't feeling comfortable using video conferencing and also one thing that lucas mentioned that probably if they were um, working from home they know that uh, not all of them have a stable connections they all have access to internet but they don't have a, um, stable connections um, or strong connections um, to hold up video conferencing um, that they are uh, feel comfortable talking to their um, um, to other judges. So um, that was how all it uh, started. Then other uh, federal courts start issuing documents about how the um, online processes will be conducted. And then on June 2020, yeah, last month, the federal judicial courts um, issued a document saying that their sessions will be on video conference. And um, it, um, the, um, how claims can be filed online. And, um, but what happened between March and June? Besides that all processes just stopped, they were all suspended uh, the minute the coronavirus came. And since we weren't using enough and we weren't socializing enough how to use online process, how to these things that I said before, uh, everything was suspended. Uh, then a little by little, uh, things start changing, but it, it, they were mainly on hold. That's the truth. Some states could um, also um, um, issue their rules for filing claims or um, issue their decisions online. So uh, the divorce over Zoom took place actually last month. Uh, in, in that case, um, a hearing, a confirmation hearing was pending if I'm not wrong. And that was the last step for that process that had been um, time consuming and all the things that we know that uh, it could be um, uh, implied during a divorce. So the, this was in the state of Mexico and that was uh, something that um, really that was really celebrated over the internet and the divorcee was actually went viral because he, uh, she celebrated that she could uh, have the, the divorce over Zoom. And actually, if you are curious about it and you uh, and you <laughs> type 
Valeria de Versu, Mexico, uh, you, can, you can see the entire story. So I was talking um, uh, also that what happened uh, between March and June that was the, the use of electronic signature um, is widened. Um, so much more people now, like I said before, was, uh, is interested in using it. People that um, usually rejected the use of electronic signature and uh, people that um, actually think that its use can um, bring more trouble than benefits. They are changing their mind now and I'm very happy about that. Um, uh, something that is important is that um, Despite the document issued by the federal court, not all local courts allow online process. Actually, only 10 courts, 10 states, um, allow this type of process. So in the other, uh, in the other states, uh, or, uh, at state level, many processes are still suspended because they don't allow online process, unlike um, uh, federal courts. And even though in the, um, uh, at federal level they are allowed, I'm not sure how um, how are people accepting it. I, I know it's it's more accepted now, but probably it it will take a little time. Okay, I, I'm sorry so, for interrupting, uh, but we soon need to move to to the discussion part. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, that was the last thing. So thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. I was I was just in time. <laughs> um, okay, um, that's uh, an interesting uh, portion, uh, especially for me. It was very interesting to know that somebody is uh, hearing our email. Uh, there's something new. Uh, so um, probably we now can uh, switch to the second uh, part, and we can have a discussion. And uh, Anna Paula, you you may. Looks like it stopped. Um, yeah. Actually, we have um, some live questions. Um, let's just do this uh, short Q and A for part um, one. Um, or, but um, actually, um, Anna Paolo, what I, I liked, uh, I found interesting about your presentation was the fact that the infrastructure was there ready to use, and it was um, the um, the people who had hesitation um, of using it, not maybe fully understanding um, what it was used for, um, or whether, or whether it was good or not. Uh, there was hesitation. Uh, so um, perhaps one possibility is to have um, some uh, presentations in high school as well so that people know that the, this infrastructure is available and how to use it um, because it seemed like the communication hadn't been there and had it not been for uh, the coronavirus um, use of it might have been um, still restricted um, well I think I'm not sure if the problem are high schools or if the um, conference on uh, conferences on high schools um, are a um, suitable solution for this because I think the obstacle are us the lawyers so probably it, uh, we need to socialize the use of these tools on universities um, because uh, lawyers not only clients, Lawyers are um, dubious about the use of these tools. They um, and sometimes uh, we need to be honest. We're we're, um, we're techies, yeah. We know we we know how to use technology, but many lawyers are not familiar with the use of technology, and many lawyers don't um, uh, don't get along. Uh, don't don't um, yeah. They, they don't um, like the use of new technologies. They use their all good email and that's pretty much it and sometimes they are afraid of new technologies so i think we need to educate lawyers on the use of technologies um, because otherwise the um, um, it could be um, a, a waste of time and money the development of such infrastructure that by the way is proprietary software i know that um, lucas mentioned something about open source 
uh, software for um, online process, but I think it's unlikely in Mexico to happen uh, with uh, open source software. That needs to be proprietary software. All right, okay, thank you. Um, so now we're heading into part two. Uh, so I'll be asking um, some questions. And uh, so off to the first question. Uh, in a globalized world, should there be a standardized format solution abiding, for instance, to international human rights law? Or does it make better sense for each community, state or institution to do it their own way according to local rules and values? So, Frédéric, if you're yeah. wanting to answer the question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, just before, can I uh, answer to Marta Correra or can we, I don't know, because... Sure, you, know, you, can, the, you can also um, answer uh, because, to Marta. Because, and then. Yeah, she touched on a really interesting uh, point. Um, and in my presentation, I presented it, uh, I presented video conferencing and its use uh, in Luxembourg more uh, as a fact than uh, as an excuse. Of course, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, when video conferencing is necessary, um, it is uh, used and plus uh, I know that uh, in 2019 um, the State Information Technology Center um, set up like uh, the three instructor, instruction chamber in Luxembourg um, set up video conferencing in uh, instruction chamber. So, um, it, it really also depends on if you are in like criminal law or in civil law, the use of video conferencing will differ from one case to another. And of course, it has to be to be used when it's necessary and we have to, to guarantee uh, its use when it's uh, necessary. So uh, thank you very much, Marta, for this interesting uh, question. And uh, now I can answer your uh, second uh, question, uh, Sandrine. Um, so um, I would say that um, depending on uh, the location, uh, different rules will uh, shape the way the technology uh, will be designed and the design and format um, for the same technology will necessarily uh, differ from uh, one state to another. For instance, if you take uh, the very simple example of a data protection regulation, um, it implies, for instance, that uh, data processors have to take into account uh, the, pro the privacy by design principle at the very beginning of uh, the technology development. Otherwise, they will, in they will incur heavy uh, administra administrative fines. And it will be not the same case in the US. Um, even though you have the privacy shield, um, maybe in the US, they won't have um, the same um, meaning of what a personal data is. And it also depend, um, depends on our cultural uh, heritage and ban background. Um, so maybe we can think of a, a minimum standard um, and it would take the form maybe of a non-binding guideline um, such as the European Ethic Charter on the Use of AI in Judicial Systems. Um, so uh, each state will be, um, won't be a bind and can adapt uh, itself uh, to uh, the non-binding uh, guideline. So maybe a minimum standard, yes. Okay, and Anna Paola, your thoughts on the question? Uh, 
Um, I'm yeah, probably not sure if a standardized format, but uh, as we can see in cyber law, um, things are more um, um, standardized, not like a unique format, for example, but we have certain principles that which we, we share with other nations. So probably not the um, strictly a format, but probably a format that shares uh, some some type of uh, principles or values or something. Um, but you still need to take into consideration the jurisdiction. Sure, of course. All right. So um, off to the second question. And um, so what would a basic minimum solution possibly look like? Then we're, we're referring to this basic minimum. Would it be Zoom and WhatsApp or uh, another public prototype um, on which courts, including arbitration courts and tribunals, can build on autonomously? And what would the characteristics be? Would, it be, would there be encryption, video on demand, video by default? So we have Anna Damska, Gernon, would you want to say a few words on this? Yeah, uh, you, uh, as I said, I'm not an uh, IT specialist, so I can only base uh, on my experience uh, from, let's say, daily, daily work. But I want to say that I, I, I'm not sure if, if the state itself has, uh, you know, creating a system uh, of uh, uh, IT communication, IT tools to be used by, uh, by, the, by the judiciary, it's, it's a big task. So perhaps it is more reasonable to use these solutions that are already available in the market, of course, with uh, proper security solutions to be applied. Because this is very important that uh, the connection between the court and uh, the parties to the to the hearing is secure. That this is encrypted. That nobody can enter who is not uh, not uh, not uh, and not uh, who should not uh, take uh, take uh, take part in it. But uh, this commercial solutions, I think that they are definitely more um, better developed than this that can be developed by by the state agencies themselves. And this is what we can observe in Poland, Ukraine that. Uh, these state uh, state enterprises uh, do not provide this, the same quality uh, services as these kind of Zoom, WhatsApp, etc. We have conducted in Ukraine the analysis for for uh, for our uh, for the state judicial administration. They have asked us to analyze uh, these um, uh, uh, applications uh, available on market. Also comparing with with the with the one that was developed by uh, by the state enterprise, and of course these commercial uh, commercial provide better better service than the one developed by, by the state. But uh, but if I may just return for a moment to the first question, if it's mm -hmm. allowed, uh, I would sure. like also to, to underline when when we talk about some values and joint principles i would really re, re, refer to these uh, principles of a fair trial publicity of the trial that must be uh, guaranteed also when we have this uh, justice on, on online so just a short comment to this what was before us thank you so lucas Okay, what would a minimum solution look like? I would say a hybrid from Zoom and WhatsApp. And why is that? Because WhatsApp is so easy to, to use and Zoom has that, that feature that's the breakout room when you can separate people in separate rooms. And that would be great for witnesses and people that not can hear what others are saying. So that would be perfect. On which courts would it be allowed? It's a polemic question, but principally when the case when the case handles just document proofs, because if you need to to make an interview uh, or sometimes it's needed to to feel what the other person is saying to, to see it's true or not and online it's really difficult probably we will we'll have some means to handle that in the future but 
Nowadays, I cannot see how can we do that. On the other hand, when it's, a, it's a urgent matters, matter, principally now in, in coronavirus pandemic, I would say everyone should be able to use it. Okay, and should it be the public uh, sector providing for such a hybrid? Um, would they build on this or um, should it be more um, public-private cooperation? I do, think... do you see an issue with them? Be, you, what's that being used, for instance? Um, with... Yes, yes. Yeah, it's being used today. I was in an audience, in a hearing, in WhatsApp, and I think it's really dangerous. Everyone knows that Facebook is really polemic dealing with data. But what I think is that governments, especially in Brazil, they do not have the right people and the right tools to build a solution. And probably a mixed partnership between public and private would be great since they could make the, the, the code public for everyone to know it's really encrypted and what they're doing with all the data. And so if the tribunals can build it, yes, I've, they can of course, but I think they won't be able to. And which characteristics, characteristics should it have? I would say open source, encrypted, with breakout room and record features. Why record in order to make it public in the future? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. What, what is also very Anna, you, you wanna say something? Yeah, if I may add, what is also very important, this is, uh, you know, possibility to, to save documents, you know, like in the cloud or something that you can have documents available that are also secure, that are also, that are also encrypted. And um, you have mentioned here, here, uh, Lucas has mentioned the Zoom. And, you know, from my point of view, also as a, as a former judge and now taking into account my experience from working remotely from, from last uh, three months, actually Zoom has all the features that can be easily adapted for a need of uh, of, uh, of uh, court hearing. So I can really imagine this kind of a public-private cooperation to develop like an effective tool for conducting uh, court hearings um, fully online. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so off to our third question. And it actually goes to what we were saying slightly. So should the apps and user interfaces for remote and online courts be delivered by the state, independent body or private sector? What would the pros and cons be? What does it look like for you locally? So Anna Paula, maybe you would like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think they can be developed by the state or the private sector or they can uh, be done through a public-private partnership. The um, important thing here is the transparency of the procedure. That is not a catch for the private sector by building this technology or um, also uh, if the tool is uh, developed in, um, independently by the private or the public sector, um, how the, the data will be, the personal data will be managed. Because I think sometimes there are many questions and there are things about um, the, the that are that are processed. Um, so I think I, I agree they can be done the, developed by um, the par private or public sector. Okay. And Frederic, what is your perspective? Uh, yes, so I share uh, Anna's um, position and opinion. Uh, it can be developed uh, by the state or by a pre private uh, firm. Um, however, we have also to pay attention to uh, the nudging effect. I don't know if you heard about it. It's um, it's um, how the uh, interface or the application can influence your choices 
Uh, for instance, there are studies uh, which shown that um, you will be more able to choose an information in the middle of the screen um, instead of the one in the corner, even though this second uh, choice is more relevant for yourself. And so there are always uh, some risks of nudging. And uh, if we are developing such interfaces, we really have to pay attention. And also, uh, the more it's complicated to understand the inter interface, the more the user will pay attention to all the information. So, uh, we will have, I think, to think uh, about uh, this. And also, if it's uh, like the public sector, which is developing it, um, or the private one, it will enhance like interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approach. And we have maybe to promote uh, this while uh, developing uh, such interfaces and applications. Thank you. And Marisha? Yeah, I'll probably say uh, that which infrastructure do you want to have? It depends on, first, I think, on the budget that you might have, the budget that you have allocated for the digital transformation of any type of courts. Um, Secondly, it, it speaks to culture and having I mean, in consideration the culture and the stakeholders that interact with your court system. Why? Because, for example, some cultures are more open to private infrastructure, to private enterprises, and some other countries might be a little bit hesitant about uh, private companies uh, giving some type of services regarding virtual courts. So first, budgeting, then culture and and stakeholders, and the third uh, aspect that would depend on upon is, uh, and I think goes to something that Frederick was talking about, is the, the interdisciplinary or collaboration work that we have with other industries. Uh, if we have, for example, uh, a judicial system that is willing to work with other industries and they have the time and they're willing to say, invest the time into creating their own platform, that'll be great because sometimes what happens is you want to duplicate the system of a different country, but once you try to duplicate the same system, you find things that are not appropriate to your own jurisdiction. So depending on the level of collaboration and investment of time that you're willing to take, uh, you can have, you can create your own system. Uh, if you ask me my personal question, I always think that it's better if a judicial system uh, builds their own system the reason why, because it's in the long term, it's going to be more sustainable and it's going to be something that they feel comfortable with instead of being some, for example, being a software or program given by a third party that sometimes changes could take additional time uh, into making. However, that speaks to the factors that I told you about. If you don't have the budgeting or you don't have the judicial system that is willing to invest the time, then you can interact with, let's say, hybrid solutions that incorporate some aspects of your infrastructure, your digital infrastructure, and additional elements from the uh, private aspect of things. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Paula, anything to add to what's been said? Sorry, come again. Anything to add to what's been said regarding question three? Um, yes, I remember that China developed uh, its uh, virtual court system using Tencent. Uh, so they they are. Um, it was actually a, a public procurement um, procedure. So um, they assure that the transparency on the procedure, the management of the data, and I think they are. A, good example of, uh, of uh, development on infrastructure by the private sector. Probably I'm not sure if, um, I, I, I know, like Marys, you have mentioned that probably um, the public sector will be much more comfortable if they develop their own infrastructure. But I think at least in Mexico, they don't have the resources, um, the resources 
not any resources, uh, <laughs> budget or human resources to build such an infrastructure. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So then off to question four. What are the next most important steps to online courts? So Anna Damska, would you like to add anything to this? You know, uh, for sure, I think that coronavirus has shown that many countries are not ready to have this uh, digital justice to to apply digital justice. So, in many in many places, it is needed to develop systems uh, of electronic files, uh, various platforms to enable uh, to conduct court hearings uh, online. So, th this is something. This is now like like, like a must because we cannot afford that the next uh, pandemic comes and uh, we will, will close courts again for, for a few months as it happened in, in many European countries in, in this case. So for sure like a um, full uh, uh, electronic case file system uh, and a platform to conduct uh, hearings especially in cases where it is to deal with lawyers when you do not hear when you do not have to hear witnesses is, is a must in my opinion. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I will um, talk from my French and Luxembourg uh, perspective. And if I might compare like an uh, online court with a, a car, I would say that we already have uh, the chassis, the frame, we have the window. Um, but uh, we only have uh, three wheel, and um, because we 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 cannot drive our car yet, uh, we some legal tech offer the possibility to lodge a case online, uh, but uh, in certain uh, domain, and it's not. Uh, functioning well. Uh, we also uh, can um, file electronic, uh, e electronically uh, documents on the RPVA that I mentioned in my presentation. So you have many initiatives. Uh, so I would say that the next step uh, would be to strengthen uh, the running tools. Um, and in Luxembourg, maybe to think of a uh, network to uh, the exchange of uh, documents, maybe. Thank you. Lucas? I would say we need to make some legislation that can adapt our system to it. We made a really important we did a we did a huge step in 2015 when we decided to that all the files should be all the cases should be filed online. But now we still have this problem regarding the hearings when it's possible, when it's not, when it's easier. So the legislators they will have a big big work now to decide it and. In per they should invite the population to to talk about this too. All right. Okay. Interesting. So, question five: What are the alternative means to access to justice in the court system? How can tech facilitate such access? Uh, Ana Paula. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are some um, uh, online dispute resolution methods uh, that can be uh, much more easier to access than the traditional methods, but I'm not seeing the question. I wanted to see the end of the question. There were two parts, but I'm not seeing it on the screen. Oh, yeah. And how can tech facilitate such access? I think socializing and educating people on how this could be um, how this could be facilitating their lives. They don't have to spend some time. I, I, this is probably an analogy. When I said, um, please use electronic signature, 
uh, please uh, trust on the cloud and um, using cloud computing because at, at the end of the day, you will end up scanning your document uh, with a uh, wet signature and uh, you'll store it you will store it on the cloud. So um, you're saving steps and uh, saving money at the same time if you use the, 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 the cloud computing system. So uh, I think educating people and um, saying um, the benefits that they can obtain um, using um, accessing these technologies, um, that could be very useful. And how would you say um, we should educate them? Uh, through which means? Would it be online, on TV? How, how would the education um, be brought to the, the public? Uh, that's an interesting question, but uh, kind of tricky depending on the um, country. Because sometimes we think that, yeah, maybe if we um, launch a campaign on um, even on social networks, on, um, on traditional radio, on TV, on ads everywhere, we can um, educate people. But also it needs to be taken into consideration that in some countries, for example, in some regions of Mexico, remote regions in, in Mexico, um, people don't have access to electricity sometimes or sometimes they have uh, very bad connections to the internet. So um, that's why I think it's a very interesting question, but uh, tricky to answer. Okay, and Lucas? Thank you. Alternatives Your take means on to... Five. Okay, uh, the five, the fifth question, yep. or... Okay. Good question, or... The alternative means to access to justice, I would say there are the, the classic ones, such as agreements, conciliations, small claims courts. And nowadays we have also the ODRs that would have help a lot in countries where most of the, the people, they have a stable connection to the internet. And how can tech facilitate such access? I would say that they make the law easier to understand, easier to access, and they can easily spread the law for people that don't know which their right is, how can they act, how can they can access the law. I mean, the government should make that, right? Say, tell you how, how is your right, what's your right, how you could access it, and but they don't, so the, the legal tax, they will probably be do this job for, for the people. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so now off to question six. Where does access to justice start and where does it end? So, Anna Damska, maybe you'd like to take this question? Yeah, I, I think it is more like a question of, of philosophy. But you know, I think that when, when, when it comes to access to justice, first uh, a person must be aware of uh, his or her rights. So I think that this access to justice starts with kind of a proper education, proper knowledge. So uh, also possibility to, to obtain information about your rights, legal advice about your rights is very, is very important. And uh, indeed, all these uh, IT solutions can be very helpful in it because thanks to internet, more people can reach lawyers, can get information about uh, their rights, can even get legal advice if there is such a, such a system arranged. So I would say that uh, as always, ex justice or access to justice starts with, 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 with awareness of rights that you have. That of course, then you can go farther to, to defend, to protect your rights or to ensure your rights. And sometimes you need a court for it but not not always sometimes you can just uh, stay with with a proper legal advice so. thank you uh, Ana Paula oh uh, thank you Sandrine I think uh, I agree with Anna 
that this is uh, this seems much more like a philosophical question, but um, I think um, access to justice starts uh, digital access to justice starts with the possibility of having access to such justice. Um, but probably um, speaking strictly, will um, I, I, I'm not sure if it starts with you with you or with the uh, with the person filing a claim electronically. That will be like very, 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 very legal definition and ends with a decision, but um, that will be strictly legal. I think it um, it will end uh, when justice is served. Oh, nice answer. Um, Frédéric? Yes, uh, so as uh, both Anna said, um, access to justice includes to have access to a competent uh, professional. And in France, some legal tech are already offering like B2C uh, services like call a lawyer or legal start. And you also have uh, the reception service uh, for litigant in France, which is called um, uh, SOJ in French. And it's a service uh, which has three es essential missions. The first one is like a general uh, information mission. The second one is a tailor-made tailor uh, information mission, uh, which means that it gives information about all pr proceedings um, which concern the citizens. And it has a, a third um, mission, which is a, a collection mission. It collects, collects all the documents uh, provided by the litigants, uh, which need to be transmitted to the competent court. Also, access to justice includes, I would say, the possibility to lodge a case. Um, and it's also it also includes uh, the possibility to have access to court rooms. And actually, it's the question of uh, public hearings and the public service of justice has to uh, guarantee this access even in a lockdown period. And as a great uh, philosopher uh, said, uh, publicity is like the very soul of justice and where there is no publicity there is no access to justice and there is no justice so um, I agree with uh, Anna uh, that it's a very like a broad question and um, of course uh, you can um, it's a more a philosophical uh, question sure great well, thank you very much for your answers. Um, now we're heading off to question seven. Does digital make the justice system more resilient to change and crisis? So do we see it maybe not being resilient, uh, not making the justice system resilient, maybe not resilient due to cyber attacks, so you're making it one, more resilient on one side, but it's not as resilient on another perspective. So maybe Lucas, you want to take this question? Yes, I think it does because now we can see, even though we have precarious systems of online justice, in, even in Europe and the US, we are still able to manage all these cases. So in, on one hand, it's possible to make it more resilient because we will provide this, the justice for all those that need, even in chaotic circumstances. But on the other hand, I have a lot of issues about the data, data privacy because besides Europe, and I know that Mexico too, they have a really good legislation. In Brazil, we, we are not, this data privacy legislation is not due yet. So I don't know what will happen with all the data that we are making available online. And for the justice, that's, that's really important, right? 
definitely. So, Anna Paula, would you like to also add a few words? Yeah, sure. Sure, I think, um, yeah, probably we can build much more resilient systems uh, when we build digital um, um, digital uh, or virtual cards. And uh, we need to um, stop thinking that online courts are less resilient than traditional courts. And even though justice is an ancient, an old concept, our processes do, don't need to be that old as the concept of justice. We are delivering an old concept through a modern process. And that is um, per se, I think, much more resilient because we are adapting uh, the process to modern times. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. Okay, um, Anna Adamska. Oh, so yeah, I I think that, that uh, thanks to these modern solutions, uh, justice system will become more resilient to these crises we are facing now. Of course, it requires a lot of uh, of um, uh, measures to ensure security of the system of the system etc but i want to return to this, uh, this uh, such a saying that justice delayed is justice denied this is what we have to remember and you know for example like in poland uh, courts were uh, operating on a very limited uh, mode uh, during uh, the coronavirus so like three months delay it's really a long a long time in many cases so from this point of view we also have uh, to, to look at this resilience of, of, of the judicial uh, system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think um, we're done for part two. Um, we'll see if we have any Q and A's. I don't see any. Um, and we're well over time as well. But uh, thank you, everyone for your time, very impressive. Um, I enjoyed hearing you, listening to you. So, um, and thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. It was thank very, very much interesting. For the invitation. Nice to meet you all, guys. Thank you very much. See you nice soon. You Bye. You yes, it See was a great you. pleasure Bye. having you. Bye. 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 Bye.